My name is Nathan Stretch, and I'm the Division Manager, Community Development for Kitchener Public Library. I would like to begin tonight's event with a territorial acknowledgement. As we gather, we are reminded that Kitchener Public Library and all of its locations are settled on land that is the traditional home of the Shinoden, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee. We acknowledge that this land is part of the Haldeman Tract, an area that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River and that was promised to the Haudenosaunee Six Nations and other indigenous allies in 1784. We recognize and deeply appreciate indigenous people's historical and ongoing connection to the land. And we are thankful for and enriched by the contributions all indigenous peoples have made and continue to make in shaping and strengthening this community. As people who live and work in Kitchener, we aim to renew our accountability to those indigenous nations and all indigenous peoples and communities living in Canada and around the world today. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to truth and reconciliation now and for future generations. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening to celebrate our 2023 One Book, One Community Read, Seven Fallen Feathers, Racism, Death, and Hard Truths in a Northern City by Tanya Talega. This year marks the 22nd year for One Book, One Community, making it the longest running community reading program of its kind in Canada. One Book, One Community supports reading, celebrates books, and storytelling, and showcases Canadian authors. Kitchener Public Library has a bold vision for our community, and your support helps programs like One Book, One Community flourish. Your generosity helps us remain responsive to our community's needs in new and necessary ways while fostering a culture of belonging and resilience. Please consider donating to One Book, One Community at Kitchener Public Library this season. Details are available on our website at kpl.org. Like many of you, I have been looking forward to this evening, and we are honored to share Seven Fallen Feathers with you all. Seven Fallen Feathers is a powerful, well-researched, journalistic investigation of the untimely deaths of seven indigenous children at schools in Thunder Bay. It is an examination of the ongoing legacy of colonialism in Canada, and it is a title our community will reflect on for years to come. Joining us this evening as our moderator is Judith Pereira. Judith is the arts and books editor for The Globe and Mail. She joined The Globe and Mail in 2001 as an intern at the Report on Business magazine while doing her master's degree in publishing. After a stint as a features editor for GlobeandMail.com, she spent nearly two decades as an editor at the magazine where she won several national newspaper awards. Judith has recently interviewed authors on stage for the Toronto Festival of Authors and Eden Mills Festival, and most recently here on stage in October with Wabgishi Grice. We are thrilled to welcome her back to our stage tonight. Welcome, Judith. <laughs> our honored guest this evening is Tanya Telega. Tanya is of Anishinaabe and Polish descent with roots in the Fort Williams First Nation in Northern Ontario. She is a journalist, storyteller, and the acclaimed author of the national bestseller, Seven Fallen Feathers, which has won the 2018 First Nation Communities Read, the RBC Taylor Prize for Literary Nonfiction, and the Writers' Trust of Canada Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. Seven Fallen Feathers was also a finalist for the Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for Nonfiction and the BC National Award for Nonfiction, and now is our 2023 One Book, One Community Read. Tanya has worked as a journalist for more than 20 years, first with the Toronto Star and now as a regular columnist with the Globe and Mail. She has been nominated five times for the Missioner Award Canada's premier journalism award celebrating excellence in public service journalism. 
She is also the founder of Makwa Creative, a production company formed to elevate indigenous voices and stories. We are grateful to share seven fallen feathers with our community and grateful for your time this evening. Bonjour. Welcome Tanya Talega to the stage. I, I loved certain portions of the book that were so, that made me rethink Canada and rethink. And then there's all these little moments in there that are thrown in of detail that you're like, what, what? How did you piece together all those details? That's a, I mean, it's a lot. How do you manage that? It's, it was pretty chronological too, right? Luckily, I had been writing newspaper stories about the disappearance of Jordan Wabas and what had happened to the other kids for a while. And so I had, um, I had a basis of that. And then when the inquest into the deaths of the kids happened, um, I covered the inquest as well, both remotely and in Thunder Bay. And Jody Porter, a CBC reporter that has passed away, uh, she was a friend of mine and a wonderful, incredible writer that I owe a great debt to because she fought to be there every single day. And she covered the inquest every day for eight months. And um, her, actually her tweets, believe it or not, were of incredible help to me too, for just like knowing the mood when I wasn't there and what was going on. So that was a big help too. I had all this information, right? And I was privy to all of the inquest material as well. I had everything. And so I could look and I could see where the stories were. But the thing is, is that I could see backwards and forwards too because um, uh, Lee Miracle once described this to me in, in this way. And she said, you know, as a First Nations author, we see in a circular realm, we see forwards and backwards at the present time. Like, it's all like this. So that's going to take me to the next question because now the storytelling that you are participating in, and especially with the podcast, is not necessarily linear. And how does that, has the journalism sort of fallen back? Is there a new way to think of storytelling? How, is, how, how have you changed in that? Hmm. I think that I was always that way. I was always that storyteller of sort of forwards, backwards, and present all at the same time, which would frustrate the heck out of my editors at the star, right? They would always cut the, um, um, when I'd go on about the Indian Act or, or, you know, why it is we got here, that, but it's, space is precious, so that would always go. But that's what we call context, right, in, in stories. And then that would usually the first thing that got thrown out. Um, and it's, to me, I just see in a circular way does that, that makes any sense? Yes, it does. I mean, I lived, um, I lived in Iqaluit, and I lived in the north. And then what I found is that people, when they tell stories, they don't necessarily... It doesn't go from one to this to this. It just kind of meanders, and there's this roundness and fullness to it. Yes. And there's and no it, answer, no. per se. And so that's when I was reading your piece. That it was sort of... I could see that change happening. And so I'm just wondering if that's now your way of telling stories, like you've just sort of discarded. Mm -hmm. I think it was always my way of telling story, right. but before I was boxed into a different mode. Right? right. I was like, okay, you've got to do it this way, and we want to see this up high in the story, and we want this here and want that there. Because you work with editors that want all of that done, right? Are podcasts more accepting of... Okay. Totally, yeah, yeah, totally are. I, I did a podcast series uh, called Seven Truths. Um, By the way, you should listen to that. <laughs> um, and it's on Audible. And we looked at the seven grandfather teachings, actually, uh, and they were teachings that uh, had been taught to me by Elder Sam Achnipanenskum. And he was a huge help because uh, when we did the podcast, we have Sam... Uh, speaking in our language 
explaining what each is, what each teaching is, what it means. And then I use each teaching to tell a story. So seven is very, this is a very important number. And we talk about it a bit, you talk about it a bit in the book. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, I don't know whether we want to talk a bit more about that idea and when you heard about seven, what that kind of mm -hmm. meant. Mm -hmm. Right. So as you guys know, because you've all read the book, um, when I um, was first, well, I should back up a little bit, just in case you haven't read the book. There's a little bit of a story. So I was working at Queen's Park. I was at the Toronto Star's um, Queen's Park Bureau. And I pitched a story on why it is First Nations folks don't vote in elections. This was 2011. This was before the TRC. This was uh, before I don't know more, before the social media rise that we've seen with so many of our stories. I mean, believe it or not, 2011 was a far different time than 2023. Not that things have gotten like a whole heck of a lot better, but it was a different time. Yeah. It was a different time. Harper and was... It was, that's right, that it was, was Harper. Harper. That's right, against Jack Layton. And um, I pitched uh, to my national editor a story on why it is our people don't vote. And she thought it was an exotic idea. Wow, what a great idea. When, you know, never seen that story before. Why don't you go do that? And the funny thing about it was is that I was being a little bit uh, mischievous because I knew that if you were a status Indian in this country, you didn't receive the right to vote until 1960. Another shocking detail <laughs> in the book that I was like, what? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you had to basically renounce your status. If you wanted to vote for Stephen Harper or Jack. Yeah. So, cool. um, so, yeah. So I went to Thunder Bay because, you know, my mom is from Fort William. And um, I'm a member of Fort William First Nation, too. But I grew up in Scarborough and in Toronto. You know, I was pretty disconnected from my community because I grew up in the city. So I went to Thunder Bay to tell the story and I went specifically to see Stan Verity, who at the time was the, uh, the Grand Chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And it was in that talk with him when I would ask him about the election, he would ask me about why it is I'm not writing a story about Jordan, a missing 15 year old boy. And you know, we went back and forward like that for about 10, 15 minutes until I finally heard him, like, put my manic Toronto journalist self aside and open my ears and my heart to what he was saying, because I realized I'm sitting in front of a grand chief, he's trying to tell me something, I'm not listening to him, and I had to realize who I was too. And so that's when I think I put that self aside and I just opened my ears and he said, that Jordan was a seventh student to go missing or to die in Thunder Bay. And so seven, getting, see the circles? See? <laughs> so seven, to me, it was like seven fire prophecies, seven grandfather teachings. I was like, what? Seven? And, and is that the, the aha moment for you, where you pivoted the story? Or you pivoted the story in your head? No, you know, there was a pivot for sure. Um, but it wasn't the story, it was myself. It was my mm -hmm. spiritual self. Was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. oh. It was like, I don't know. And that changed everything, really. Because I, I called my editor and I said, you remember that story I'm supposed to be writing on why it is our people don't vote? I don't have that story, but I have this story. And then I told her about the story. And she's like, write that story. And I did, and the star put it on. Oh my goodness, it went off again. Oh, no, it's back, it's back. The star put it on the front page and um, I still haven't handed in the voting story. <laughs> yeah. Next election. <laughs> um, I think, why don't we now go to, it, it's been many years now since you wrote the book. Have you have you been back? Tell me about Thunder Bay and oh yeah, I go back all the time. Ooh. Tell me more. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, there's been a lot of stories about what the Thunder Bay Police Department um, 
what's happened to the uh, what mm -hmm. the, the high school itself and mm -hmm. some of the stuff that that's mm -hmm. happened there. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that. What has happened in Thunder Bay and the Thunder Bay police in, in particular? Mm -hmm. So things are moving along. Um, I wish I could tell you that everything was better. I wish I could tell you that everything was fine. So it's going out on me. I think the spirits are with me tonight. I don't know. Um, but there are still a lot of problems in, in Thunder Bay. I mean, I'm sure you, uh, you might have seen the Crave series, Thunder Bay, that uh, Ryan McMahon did. Yes. Uh, I haven't seen it. I've seen parts of it, yeah. it's. I don't want to see it. It's actually, like, it makes you angry, but it makes you so sad. Yeah. It's, it's, um, yeah. It's a lot. Well, it's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. But it's like we live it, right? Yes. Like our families live it. Our friends live it. Like, like we live it. It's funny because that's exactly what Wob said when he was talking about, um, you know, we were talking about apocalypse and mm -hmm. that kind of, mm -hmm. and it's like we live the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe you don't need to. Right, so it's just, you know, there's a new police chief. He's Métis from Alberta, I believe. The board still has some issues. There's been a turnover at the police board. You know, the police board polices the police. But we still have missing kids. We still have missing youth. We still have our people being beaten up uh, for no reason. We have assaults. I mean, there's still racism in Thunder Bay. There's racism all over Canada. You know, it's still, we're not at a point of understanding yet. But what is wonderful is that people are talking about it in Thunder Bay. It's wonderful that our people are standing up and we do things together to, to make our presence more vibrant and no. That's important. Well, one of the shocking things in the book is that, you know, um, a child goes missing and you talk to the police and they don't they don't come they don't take it seriously they don't they don't care <laughs> and you don't hear from them for days and um if it wasn't for people coming from other communities to search because they know that they're the only one so has that changed? Is that better? Is there something? I, um, I wish I could say for every single person, every case, but I, I can't, right? Every case is different and everyone, every family has their own story, but I mean, there's been all, there's been so many problems still again with the police and there's been human rights complaints, you know, one after the other within the force itself. There are still problems of how people are being treated 100%. You know, um, we still have issues like there's no coroner facilities in uh, Thunder Bay. So our people are flown. One of the things also in, in the book that is so shocking was about the education. Um, you know, that there is no, because it, the Indian Act doesn't have the Indian Act, even saying the Indian Act, it just, I, you know, it's, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. We have this crazy act <laughs> that still exists in 2023 mm -hmm. that determines so much. And, um, and the education portion of it is that as you go from First Nation to First Nation, the education changes depending on, right. and how does that sort of, what's happened since since your book came out to now? Is there? Well, that's still a mess, um, unsurprisingly. I mean, uh, the federal government should not be in the education business, so to speak. We still have so many kids that are not in school. You know, uh, kids that are in their communities that need to go to school, would like to go to school, and they can't. 
For instance, Pelican, uh, Pelican High School, which is just outside of Lac Seul First Nation and Sioux Lookout, there's a housing shortage. And due to the housing shortage, they can't hire enough teachers. And since they can't hire enough teachers to be at the high school, children have to stay in their communities 200, 300, 400 kilometers away and can't come to high school. This is 2023. We don't have high schools in our communities, in our nations that want them and need them. Sometimes our schools go up to grade 9 or grade 10. And then the kids, those kids are flying out or they're not flying out. I mean, if there is no place for them at Pelican, then they can't fly out. Or DFC in Thunder Bay. You know, it's not... Um, one thing that has changed for the better 100% is Matawa. Matawa um, was the school that Jordan went to. And when I wrote about Jordan's disappearance, it, Matawa was an office building. It was right off Arthur Street, and it was, you know, a three or four story sort of brown, nondescript um, office building. There was no play, not playgrounds, there was no field, there was no sports field, there was no cafeteria. I mean, it was just like little offices. Now, Matawa, the tribal council, got together, and there, is, there was funding put together, and there's a beautiful residence that's been opened up, and a high school that's been opened up with incredible land, land-based learning, language. That is such a beautiful testament to Jordan and Jordan's memory, and that is wonderful. But there's still so many kids that are in need of schooling. And we've had recommendations now from multiple about kids having to leave communities and what happens to them when they go to a place like Thunder Bay. These are 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14, I mean, <laughs> they're by themselves. They're lost, they've never been in a city. And I guess uh, there's just this sort of, when do, when do we as collectively learn about that and say, okay, actually this is what we have to do. You were saying that things have changed at, um, um, the, the high school as well, or? At Matawa? Well, Matawa. No, not Matawa, but the other. Uh, oh, DFC? DFO, yeah, DFC. Yeah, well, this DFC still needs a new school, actually, because the school that they're in, I mean, the uh, asbestos had to be ripped out of the walls. And sometimes the, there's no water for the kids because there's lead in the water, so they can't drink the water in their school. Which, isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? Yes. And horrific thing you've ever heard, considering a lot of the kids maybe from communities where there is no clean water. Then they're in the city of Thunder Bay, where there is clean water for all the homes, but then you're in a high school where you need to, you know, sometimes there's water issues. It's ridiculous. I mean, they need a new school and they need um, a residence as well because those kids are still being boarded. They're still being boarded in homes, private homes in, in Thunder Bay. Okay, so let's. T <laughs> you, you, so you asked actually. You know, I'm not gonna. I'm not sorry. So you asked like, when does it stop? I don't know when it stops. You know, I don't know how many times we're supposed to tell this story, right? How many times we have to tell Canada that this is the problem? And I don't mean Canada as in Canada, the federal government. I've come round to thinking that where the change is going to be is in every person. It's gonna be you and you and you, right? It's the will of the majority. That is what's gonna actually change things. We can't rely on governments to make policies that are gonna be fair and equitable. We have to push for it. Okay. Oh. Yes, I think that's a, you know, that's a call, definitely. I'm just going to quickly go now to the Pope, because, <laughs> well, in your piece, you talk, weird, weird segue. segue. <laughs> well, I, I was just thinking, while you were talking, I was like, oh, this cultural genocide, and then the genocide kind of went to the Pope, and then I'm like, oh, right, 
these residential schools. So they're all kind of, I'm, I'm going in a circle. Um, but let's start with this idea of cultural genocide, which is, it's not an idea, it's, that's what it is. But we still can't say it. And perhaps, let's take a further step back. Let's talk about the truth and reconciliation and this idea of truth. Maybe for us to actually be willing to say something, we first have to recognize the truth of what is happening. And maybe that's where it's, I don't know. I don't know if we are, we know what's happening sometimes. Um, can you talk about that? And whether that truth portion of it, what does that entail? We're still listening to the truth. We're still trying to find the truth out. We are not there yet. You know, when you talk about truth and reconciliation, you have to do the truth part first, right? Before you can get to the reconciliation. We are still in the truth phase. We're still trying to find answers. We're still trying to understand the true nature of what's happened in this country. You know, I've written three books on genocide. This book is about genocide, and it's not cultural genocide, too. It's genocide. The second book, All Our Relations, I started out writing about children in our communities and why it is they're taking their lives at their own hands in such incredible numbers. And, you know, at first I started looking at Western medical science. I was reading all the medical reports I could. I was reaching out to doctors and to nurses to ask them, why is this happening? Why is this happening in Pekanjikam or Attawapiskat or Bella Bella? You know, what is going on? And I came all the way around to, of course, you know, it's a, it's a lack of belonging. It is a lack of knowing our languages and who we are and then being violently taken from the land and put into residential schools and put into onto reserves and like boxed in to places. It is the 60s scoop. It's all of these policies that lead to and contribute to the deaths of our children. And so to me, this is a this is genocide too, right? Because it's still going on, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. It all is connected. Well, the fact that we can't say the word genocide. Right, right. You know, um, And that's the truth, right? That's the truth that we have to get to. And we can't start correcting and changing minds until we can say the word. There must be a great grief, I think, in not being able to f figure out the truth and not be able to, to realize that others don't see truth. I think the, the grieving, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate because I think that if Canadians could kind of confront that, that maybe that grief could be, could be healed or talked about. But so how do we how do we get to the truth? How do we start that process? Do we is it the media? Is it is it writers? Is it is it just keep talking? You asked about the Pope too. Oh yeah, the Pope. Yeah. Well, he said it was a genocide. Didn't he say it was a genocide? Oh yeah, but it took an Indigenous writer, um, a First Nations woman, to ask him on the plane. As he was leaving, tell on the way us back this to story. Rome. Tell us this story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was incredible. It was a Canadian press reporter, and she asked the Pope because you know they have how it works on these pools as well as when you're traveling with a whole bunch of other journalists, you have to um, uh, you have to you get one or two questions sometimes when you've got like a prime minister or a pope. And if you're on the plane, there's um, a certain amount of accredited media there. And as I've heard it, because I was not on that plane, but everyone turned to the two First Nations journalists that were on that plane and they said, what do you want to ask the pope? And so I said, that's beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And so the question was, is it genocide? And he said, yes. And so we, we had waited the whole time for her to say that when he was here on the apology tour. Yeah. And it wasn't until he was flying back over to Italy yeah. that we heard him say the words. Mary yeah. Hobson, that's her name. It's uh, going to come to me. It's, uh, I mean, that was a, a huge... Mm -hmm. At that moment, it's just like, oh, good. It's, it, it's 
Yeah, it was it was great because the the whole you know going on about the Pope here for a minute. The whole papal tour was just bizarre. You know, like we heard him apologize in mass with cheese, and then I thought that he was going to keep apologizing. Right, every place that he went and every time he spoke, I thought it would be going on and on and on, and that didn't happen. It didn't happen until he got to Iqaluit. And in Iqaluit, he apologized again, um, which was wonderful that that happened. But I think, you know, I think every single person has their own, especially as a First Nations person, we are all touched by Indian residential schools in some way, shape, or form. There is not one family out there that has not been touched by the schools. Well, it was in, in your book, it, you talked about everybody sort of the cousin. It's like, yes, of course I know that person down, yeah. you know, 400 kilometers away. That's my cousin over there. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's how it was in, in Nunavut. Everyone mm. knows each other and everyone is everybody's cousin. So I was, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, you feel a collective, mm -hmm. even if you don't have someone right in your immediate family, I'm sure you know everyone. Well, you know, it's funny, what you were talking about grief. So there's a collective grief, right? We've yeah. all um, been through the same, very similar, I should say, traumas just from virtue of being First Nations. Like, we've had in our family somebody, multiple people, multiple generations that have gone to the schools. There's always, many of us have, we know of someone that was lost or missing, never came home, the knowing. And that's actually the title of my next book, is The Knowing. We are all touched by the schools, the Indian Act, the 60s scoop. It's all connected, murdered and missing women. And so you, you know, you asked about a little bit about grief there. You mentioned grief and that you can see, you can see all of the um, all of the ties. Oh, sorry. One more question. Well, I was gonna. <laughs> I was going to say now. I'm like, oh, I forgot. Um, um, with the grief and collective grieving and, and this idea that Canadians perhaps don't see grief, but I was, it, it's, I hope that things would get better, that we are getting to a place where we can um, acknowledge what has happened. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure. Like, look, there's more than five people here tonight. Like, Amazing. It's kind of a joke, but it's not. It's true, right? You know, when Seven came out, no one knew how the book was going to do. Like, my publisher was published on purpose for when Canada was turning 150, right? And I remember my publisher saying, yeah, this book's either going to do really well or it's going to do really badly. Because at that time... First Nations literature wasn't that popular. And that's just, this is just six years ago, right? Which is kind of crazy because I was, yeah. you know, I've been talking to Wab and Cherie and, well, Eden, who's like my personal, I like, I love her. Um, Eden Robinson. Um, if you haven't read her books, you have to read her books. Um, and um, it's amazing to see how much more we're reading. In fact, the TDSB just... Um, you know, grade 11 English Indigenous authors, which, by the yay. way, yay! Yeah, oh, here too? Yay! Woohoo! Oh, in amazing. Kitchener as well. Kitchener, oh, Waterloo. amazing. That's incredible. That's so incredible. I mean, when I went to Iqaluit many years ago, I hadn't ever heard of residential schools. And it was Josie Kusugak who was, um, he talked to me about it, and I was like, residential what now? Yeah. But my, my nephews, know about it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to go now to question and answers. So there will be people coming around with um, mics. So if you have questions for Tanya, um, please put up your hand. I'll point to you. And then they'll come around with, with a microphone. microphone. That's it. I'm like, <laughs> what's the word? <laughs> 
there's someone back there. Wow, this is um, stressful to be the first. Um, I'm taking to heart, Tanya, that you said that um, you've come to the realization that we have to change people one at a time. I'm uh, starting to teach Indian horse to two grade 10 classes next week. And what can I do to hook them? Yes, there are lots of resources in Dufferin Peel where I teach, but um, what do you think I can do to hook these grade tens into realizing that they matter? Oh, make which for for coming, for driving all the way over here, um, and for teaching Richard Wagami's uh, teach keeper in me, teach embers, teach like you know when you ask what what else can do Indian horse is 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 wonderful. Um, I'm partial to Keeper and Me. But I love his books. His books really speak to me. And you have, you're lucky too, because you have the film as well, right? Um, teach more about him. And teach the children too. You know, this is something that I, I talk about in all our relations, about the need for all of us to teach our children about belonging. Um, Marie Sinclair said that all Anishinaabe kids need to ask themselves these questions. Who am I? Where do I come from? What is my purpose? Where do I belong? Four questions. And I think that those four questions can be asked by any child. It doesn't matter if you're Indigenous or not. And, um, and if you take that premise as a, you know, coming from Murray Sinclair from the TRC, Senator, a great Anishinaabe man. Take those four questions and say, and Richard Wakamis is also Anishinaabe. Um, take those four questions and say, let's open up for the class. And that, those teachings are ours. Thank you so much. Oh, I think I see a hand. Sorry, the lights sometimes, I don't, I can kind of see someone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a new grad. I'm becoming a teacher, and I'm curious if you have any advice for people who are interested in teaching on reserves. Uh, Miigwech for that question. Um, I think it would be an incredible experience for you, right? I mean... If you were to uh, work for um, Northern Anishinaabe Education Council, for instance, they have Indigenous and non-Indigenous teachers there. But again, like what I was saying, there's no housing, right? There's a housing crisis in Sioux Lookout, and um, there's no place for the teachers to live, sadly. And, you know, if you can get a, a teaching job um, in one of our communities... That would be lovely. I mean, if you're an elementary school teacher, there'll be a lot more jobs for you because there are, are elementary schools, but oftentimes the schools end at grade nine or grade 10, and then the kids have to come out. Mishki Gagamang has a beautiful school as well. There's so many um, schools. You would get an experience that would change your life, and that would be important for you going forward, I think. You talked about one of the schools that had um, sort of a radio, the radio type. Yeah, the Northern Anishinaabe Education Council. So they use radio um, to help teach the kids that can't, for some reason, come out to go to high school. I just love that they had it from right in the morning, right until yeah. late. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But it's it's also, it's it's not... Um, I've been in the remote rooms, like at Laxul First Nation, where they have um, the, the, the radio learning, and you're in like a little tiny, almost like a portable, oh, and you're yeah. sitting at a desk, and everything's gray or beige, and you know, you've got office furniture. It's not a good place to learn for kids. There's one, one down here. My question is, with our political climate, do you still have hope that this is going to change? I mean, personally, even just getting people to read your book in my book club was a struggle. We don't 
like I'm constantly um, trying to educate myself on what's happening in the Indigenous community and Canadian history. And trying to get others around me to do that has been <laughs> the biggest struggle. And, oh, it's too hard. Or, oh, you're making me read this book during the pandemic. Yeah, I am. This is important. This doesn't just go away because, you know, mm -hmm. the situations in the world. But do you still have hope for a change? Miigwech for that and for all the work you're doing to try. Totally. 100%. Like, I don't mean to sound like really <laughs> depressive or anything like that. Um, I absolutely have hope. I mean, that's what keeps me going. Otherwise, I wouldn't be writing these stories and doing all the talks that I do because I have faith in my communities. I have faith and uh, hope in all the kids, you know, that, that I know and that I see. And we have no choice but to be hopeful and to set a good example that things are going to be better because... This is what makes a stronger Canada, right? It's not just our own kids and communities. It's for everybody. And it's for all of our children. But we have to give our kids the best start possible. And by telling the truth, by talking about genocide, by reading these stories, it's only going to enrich Canada, you know? Not make it worse. And I think there is, a Con a Connie Walker was talking about this with media. There used to be a time you couldn't, like, you had to struggle to get editors to, you know, it's like, oh, why do you think that story matters? It's, it's, it, it still takes work, but it's not as much work. And it's, people are willing to listen. And there are so many more writers. There's so many more authors. There's music there's there's so much joy as well and so i think some of, seeing some of that joy and seeing some of that community together i'm i'm i think there's yeah. hope and you can you could tell people that seven fallen feathers is a story it's a book about love it's a book about strength at its heart you know it's there are hard truths and questions there but it's a it's a book about the strength of our people and our communities and i hope that that comes out when people read it thank you uh, full disclosure, my son married somebody from Thunder Bay, so I'm quite... <laughs> <laughs> and he's living there, he's a nurse practitioner, so he's practicing there. Oh, wow. I, I read your book, and with painfully, I was reading the young people losing their lives, uh, drink, binging, drinking all the time. Can you speak to that? So what's behind that? Why... They're drinking so much, and what the community is doing to, to help them. Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, I always I always say this: um, teenagers drink. They do drugs, pot, and it doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, or what color they are. Um, they all do it, right? And um, the kids in Thunder Bay, I mean, like, our kids are no different than any other kids doing that. The difference was, especially with Seven uh, and what's happening in Thunder Bay is, um, like, for instance, in the coroner's inquest, there was no explanation ever given as to why it is the kids went from the side of the riverbank into the water. There was no explanation. How did they get in there? And most of our kids grow up around water and know how to swim. And nobody, I don't care how drunk you are, wants to go for a swim in November in the Kaministiqua River. It doesn't happen. Like, you know? Um, but you're, you've got a larger question about addiction. And addiction is something that plagues our communities, yes. Um, and it has since contact, right? And why is that? all the things I've been talking about here tonight. Um, it's genocide. It's the violent removal of our people from the land. It's being boxed into communities. It's being, you know, living with 
intergenerational trauma. It's a lack of hope. It's that lack of that belonging, that feeling that people have, that spiritual connection that they have. That's what we have to teach and instill, that every child belongs, right? That every person belongs. Anishinaabe believe everything's a circle. Every person born, there's a reason for them being born. Don't break that circle. Don't break that chain, right? And so if we teach everybody about those four questions and our children, you know, I hope that that gives them strength and strength in our teachings. You know, Joan, Elder Joan is here. She's a teacher. She's a spiritual teacher, a knowledge keeper. We have to go back to that to stop the addictions. And that's hard. All the stuff that's out there now, it is killing our people. And how do we change that? We change it through fairness in the treaties, getting our people working, and actual members of the economy, not just... I was going to say economic reconciliation, you know. It's all part of it. It's all part of when you talk about, you know, genocide. And the things that I say about, uh, about that, I excerpt from the TRC something that Murray wrote about what it looks like. That's what we have to change. And then you will see our people being stronger. And I think we have time for one more question. Um. Thank you for the book. Um, on the cover is the beautiful painting by Christian Morisot. And I watched a video where he talked about the meaning of the painting and that it was his intention to give it to the prime minister. And I wondered what happened to the original. Mm. Actually, thanks for bringing uh, Christian up. I was actually thinking about him tonight, uh, being here. Christian passed away about eight months ago, and um, he had addiction issues. And that was really hard, because you're right. When, as you know from the book, he did this painting when the jury was out and he was waiting for the jury to come back, right? And so he made this incredible painting. Um, and he did want to give it to the prime minister. I don't know where the painting is now, sadly. And I don't really want to say much else about it. <laughs> it sounds really vague and weird, but um, I don't know what state the painting is in now. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you had that this was good and that you guys got. Oh. Please join me one more time in thanking Tanya and Judith for such a powerful and thoughtful conversation. Thank you.